Hugh McGuinness was unfortunately unable to make a recording for this video, but I am able to read a statement that he has made about judging the stories and his choice of, win of prize winners. It was a pleasure to read these stories and to judge the competition as a whole. If I have any advice for short story writers, it is the same advice I'd give any writer. First, learn the rules, then start to bend them. I judged this short story competition while working on a large project, an anthology of French short stories from the Middle Ages to the present day. My mind was very much occupied with what a short story should be. I worried about length, voice, narrative perspective, point of view, plot and pacing, and about how many events and characters a short story could comfortably hold. As a rule, I don't much like rules. They belong more in competitions where we all need parameters than in literature, where we go to escape parameters. At some point in these months of reading, I must have decided that what I'd learned from reading short stories was that the short story can be anything it wants. After all, no one tells the novelist that they must observe this or that shape, or the dramatist that they have to have five acts, or the poet that every poem must rhyme and scan. The stories submitted for the Bedford competition certainly showed that. There was a huge variety of theme, tone, voice, narrative, perspective, and setting. The prize-winning stories demonstrate that very clearly. In third place, A Gradual Thing by Diana Powell uses voice in a sophisticated way, pacing out its revelations and observations and handling the build-up of a story in subtle ways. There was something poetic about this story and about the way in which it's, it chose its words so carefully, never pushing its effects too hard or too loudly and always trusting the alert reader. The effect was of something serious and thoughtful, but always handled with a good sense of poise and narrative balance. In second place, The Rains by Gavin O'Toole takes a different tack, urgent in a different way, and in its own manner, speaking to today's concerns. This is introspective and bleak in a way that provokes the reader to think. It is also ambitious and tries to do a great deal in a short space of time and words. The narrative voice is well handled, creating mystery in just the right places, while also describing a landscape and an environment that becomes a character in itself. And the winner was Passport 2 by Jem Newman. Topical and urgent and set in a future that may have already happened. Written in a compact, clear style, it has no wasted words and works with dialogue to advance the situation and quickly establish character. Just enough character for the story and background, but not too much. It's a good example of the way in which a lean style and a compelling idea that maps directly onto today's concerns can reframe the familiar and give it a new twist. And we will now hear the winning story read by Matt Baker. The building had been white at one time, but now it was a dusty grey, paint flaking away here and there, crumbling brickwork exposed to the elements. The windows sported posters advertising Angel Falls and the Banal Rice Terraces, photos bleached blue by the sun. A tattered awning sheltered the doorway, which featured a large decal of a European-looking butler with a pencil-thin moustache. Ian pulled up his mask as he entered. Inside, the travel agency was furnished with grey vinyl benches, wisps of stuffing emerging from cracks in the seats, interrupted periodically by gaffer tape to ensure distance between absent clients. A woman emerged from the back to greet Ian as he stepped up to the counter. A short wall of plexiglass separated them, clouded by scuffs and scratches accrued over years of service. Good afternoon, she said brightly. Welcome to Passport 2. Where can we help you go today? Ian glanced at the posters on the wall. Milan, Cairo, Mumbai. To the movies, he said. She looked at him for a moment, then glanced around the empty travel agency. I'm sure we can help you with that. Could I see some ID, please? He slid his driver's license through the opening in the plexiglass. Ian watched as she tapped away at her computer, pausing briefly to compare his face to his photo. 
Then she came around the counter and wordlessly locked the front door. The woman sat on one of the split vinyl benches and gestured for him to do the same. He settled himself across from her and she handed his driver's license back. So what brings you in today, Mr. Lacroix? I need a vaccine card, he said. Isn't that what brings everyone here? He glanced around at the faded posters and decade-old travel magazines. I can't imagine you're selling many trips to Rome these days. Even with her mask on, he could tell she didn't return his smile. Why do you need proof of vaccination? He frowned. To go to the movies, like I said, to eat at a restaurant, to, to live a normal life again. You can't go anywhere these days without one of those damned cards. She nodded. You currently have a card? Any card? Sure, I've got the yellow one. He shifted on the bench so he could dig it out of his wallet. This is authentic, she asked, with turning it over in her hands. Not one of ours. Yeah, it's from the booster I got last March. But it's no good anymore. Last couple of weeks, all anyone will take is the green card. And, and one of the guys at work was saying he heard something about a blue card coming next year. It's supposed to work better against the virus they got in Ukraine. She pr produced a phone and scanned the card's QR code, nodding to herself. She handed the card back. This was your most recent immunization. You hadn't had the shot for C-41-7 or any of the recombinants. I don't think so. Why not? Ian sat back. He hadn't expected so many questions. He should have been in and out by now. I'm not judging, she prompted. It's just important to know. No disrespect, he said, but how is that your business? I figured I'd come in, exchange pleasantries, fork over some cash, maybe have to sit through a lecture about government overreach, and then be on my way. That's not how we do things here. No? He folded his arms. How hard is it to just print up a card? Do you have concerns about the vaccine? I'm happy to address any questions you have. His eyes narrowed. I'm starting to have concerns about this place, to be honest. Can you get me a new card or not? It was her turn to sit back. She eyed him across the table, then pulled out her phone and began swiping and tapping. There was a distant mechanical hum. She stood and crossed the office, returning with a pale green plastic card. She placed it on the table in front of her. He could see his name printed under the QR code. How much? he said, pulling out his wallet. Tell me why you need it first. For fuck's sake. She wasn't going to drop it. He looked around the shabby office as he considered how best to respond. My insurance won't cover it, he said finally. The truth was probably the best. They're fighting the government on it, saying they sh the shot from March is good enough. She nodded. Licensing fees went up again. Don't know that it matters much, though, he said. Everyone seems to be out of the new shots anyway. Can't keep up with demand. That's not strictly true, she pursed her lips. There have been times when they haven't been able to meet demand, but these days... The scarcity is mostly artificial. The vaccines are too expensive. We could manufacture to demand, but that would mean breaking patent. There was a shadow of a smile in her eyes, which would be illegal. Well, we wouldn't want to break that law, he laughed, eyeing the counterfeit vaccine card on the table between them. Who's your provider? He told her. Her brow followed. You work for the city? His breath caught. Yeah, he said as smoothly as he could. 
sanitation. So much for the truth. And you'd get the shot if you could, she prompted. You don't have any concerns about vaccination? What kind of concerns, he asked. Best to keep the conversation moving. You mean, like, is this all part of some government conspiracy? Something like that. He grinned. Don't get me wrong, I don't exactly trust the government. But given their track record of basic incompetence, what are, the, what are the chances they could manage to engineer a global super plague and somehow keep it under wraps? And if there is some group of rich elites pulling the strings, I can't imagine destroy the global economy is on the top of their to-do list. And you don't exactly need to inject someone with a microchip to tra track them, Ian thought, eyeing the phone on the seat next to her. Sounds like you thought it through, she asked. What about you, he asked, and he was genuinely curious now. You don't seem like the type to be out there protesting the mask mandate. Why are you doing this? We're filling a need, she said. Most people would take the vaccine if they could, but in the meantime, their lives are on hold. There aren't enough doses to go round, and the companies that own the patents have a stranglehold on the supply. She stood and moved behind the counter again. And that's just here, she continued. There are parts of the world that are just getting their first doses, countries where buying a shot for everyone would wipe out their entire GDP. From where he was sitting, he, could see what she was, he couldn't see what she was doing, and he didn't want to appear too interested. He shrugged. Well, if you weren't doing it, somebody else would. Plenty of other people were doing it, of course, as she must know. Most were small time, copying a card and flipping it a few times. This place, though... He looked up and saw that she'd finished whatever she was doing. She was standing at the edge of the counter, looking at him appraisingly. The silence between them stretched and began to turn sour. So, he said, gesturing at the green rectangle of plastic, you're sure this will do the trick? It will. What if they try to scan it? Or they see that I haven't been vaccinated? She snorted. I honestly can't remember the last time somebody actually scanned my card, but if they do, you'll still get the green light. How are you updating the medical records? We're not, she said, sitting down again. Uh, that would be difficult and very um, traceable. The college would have my license pulled before these squad cars even arrived. Your license, he said blankly. She pulled out an ID and set it down next to the green card. Dr. Inaya Rashid, MD. She worked at the hospital where his niece had been born. So, he began, taking a moment to process this new information. So how does it work then? If you're not updating my records, I mean. One of my clerks did a project with the government a couple months ago and got access to code for the scanner app they've got everyone using. Yanked the encryption key or something. When this card gets scanned, the app won't call out, the, out to the health database. It'll hit our server instead, and we give you the all clear. Here, I'll show you. Dr. Rashid grabbed her phone and opened the app. She scanned the card's QR code, and the app's blue background flashed green. Ian stared at the screen. This went beyond forgery. This was a cyber crime. Of course, anyone with access to your medical records can see your official immunization status, she continued. So as far as your doctor's concerned, you're still unvaccinated, at least against the most recent variants. But as far as a vaccine passport goes, you're covered. Great, he said, reaching for the card. Thanks, Doc. Hold on, she said. We're not quite done. What are you, 
Oh, oh, of course. He stood, pulling out his wallet again. You take cash, I assume? Uh, We don't, actually, she said, standing and moving behind the counter again. He frowned, surprised, and pulled out a credit card. He'd have to expense it later. When he looked up, Dr. Rashid was holding a syringe. What the hell? he exclaimed, stumbling back. Don't be alarmed, she said. What is that? Your vaccine, she said. What are you talking about, Ian said, eyeing the needle. What vaccine? She frowned. I just printed you a vaccination record and you're asking me what vaccine? Well, that's a forgery. It's not a real vaccine card. She sighed. It wouldn't be ethical or good for public health to give you a vaccination record if you hadn't actually been immunized. So I'm supposed to just let you stick me with that? If you want that card, weren't you just telling me you had no problem with the vaccine? Sure, but how do I know that's a real vaccine? Dr. Rashid shrugged. You trust me? Same as you would if you showed up in the ER with a nail in your foot, but no record of a tetanus tetanus booster. Where did you get it? You can't find C-417 doses anywhere. We manufactured it. She made a face. Uh, Not me personally, but my colleagues and I have contacts. Ian stared at her. Contacts who, what, booted up in a bathtub? She sighed. No, this came from an industrial lab, just like any other vaccine. It's identical to the dose you'd get at any other site. Exactly the same formula. Same mRNA, same suspension, same preservatives, everything. It was just made in a lab with a less rosy view of the current state of patent law than the government, she frowned. Or some of the major players in global health, sadly. And what if I don't want the shot? Her eyes narrowed. You changed your mind? Hypothetically, I mean, what if someone was scared of the government, or just needles, or whatever? Then I'd talk to them about it. But the bottom line is, you want that card? This is how you pay. Holy shit. He'd heard about the counterfeit cards, but vaccine piracy was something else entirely. Look, he said, this isn't exactly billable time for me, so I'd appreciate it if you decide quickly. He didn't know what to say. Uh, you're sure it's safe? Dr. Rashid smiled at that. He could see it in her eyes. She knew she had him. Yes, it's safe. We've done hundreds of these. And aside from a sore arm and the occasional headache, no one's had any complaints. And the way this virus hits, I know we've saved lives by now. Okay, he said, nodding. Okay, that's good to know. You don't have any allergies, she asked as she rolled up his sleeve. Chlorhexidine, polyethylene glycol. Unless you're injecting me with cat dander, I think we're good, he said. So you're really not asking for any money? Well, she said, wiping a swab against the muscle of his shoulder. We wouldn't say no to a donation. The vaccines are a lot cheaper if you ignore the patent, but we still need to manufacture and ship them. We've been sending doses to Venezuela and Chile, and I know a few of the other unofficial clinics are helping to get folks in Tunisia and Algeria immunized. Wow, he said. Good for you. Okay, just let your arm hang loose, she said, uncapping the needle. Do you want me to count you down? No, I'm good. The sirens had been getting louder for a while, but it seemed that Dr. Rashid had been too absorbed in her work to notice. She looked up in alarm as the door slammed open. 
and the armed police officers poured into the ad hoc clinic. Her eyes darted from face to face, eventually landing on Ian. She slowly raised her hands. Sorry, Doc, Ian said. He grinned weakly, a little embarrassed. I'll still take that shot, though, if it's all the same to you. Passport 2 is a story about some of the things that we do to keep each other safe. Obviously, the story is set during a global pandemic, uh, though not necessarily this pandemic, uh, but it was written during this pandemic. The first draft was written in early 2021, before any COVID vaccines were widely available, at least here in Canada. And I remember public health agencies around the world were in the midst of debating incentive systems. I've been thinking for some time about the ramifications of vaccine passports and how long it would take before forgeries of various levels of sophistication began to appear. This happened fairly quickly, of course, though I wouldn't describe this as prescient so much as inevitable. But I was particularly interested in how those who already face barriers to access, both at home and abroad, might be affected by these evolving pandemic restrictions and how intellectual property protections, uh, which some companies claim are there to protect us, can actually ultimately serve to undermine public health. But that's all table setting. Mostly, I just wanted to write a story that was readable and had a satisfying twist. And evidently, I succeeded. To be honest, this win was extremely surprising for me. I submitted the story on a lark. I would felt compelled to write it, but once it was written, I hadn't the faintest idea what to do with it. I believe that every story is political, but some stories are more political than others, and these stories can sometimes be harder to place. Add to this the fact that uh, I would describe my prose style as adequate, workmanlike, though I'm told I should instead call it clean for marketing purposes. Anyway, not the kind of writing that I typically associate with awards. But I am a medical student, and medical students quickly acclimate to being wrong about things. So I'd like to thank Patrick McGuinness for showing me that I was wrong in the most wonderful way possible. I've never been to Bedford myself, though in a past career I worked for a firm that had an office in Cambridge. I do hope to visit someday. It seems lovely but I have many more COVID vaccinations to administer between now and then. Thank you.